Assalamu alaikum, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the physics uh, colloquium. Uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Dalawar Anjum with us, uh, our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Anjum has had an illustrious career in, in physics uh, research and, and teaching. Uh, he's an accomplished uh, a researcher and has published extensively uh, before his, uh, his, 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 his current position as an assistant professor at um, Department of Physics at the Khalifa University. He received um, his PhD in, in physics uh, in 2002 from University at Albany, the State University of New York. And he is um, expert in, in transmission electron microscopy. That's what he is going to be talking about. And, and, and with this introduction, I would, uh, I would uh, uh, ask Dilawar Saab to start, please. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rafi sir. It's my pleasure to be here. So just to be, uh, you know, uh, formal, I'm gonna speak only in English, if that's okay. Yes, yes, as, as you like. Okay, all right, thank you. So uh, yes, it's my pleasure as well uh, to be here and, uh, and share my thoughts and knowledge about transmission microscopy with you guys. Um, it's a, it's a, a basically a, 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 an indispensable tool for doing research in nanotechnology. It has been all along very popular uh, do, looking at the materials at uh, nanoscales, even before the you know, birth of nanotechnology. But uh, with the birth of nanotechnology, it has even gained more uh, fundamental role in the you know, field of characterization of materials. Uh, so this is why it's very uh, uh, you know, a popular technique among material scientists uh, and even biotechnologists. So, uh, and I will give you some examples and I will show you some uh, 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 you know, evolution of this technique and things like that. So with that, I start. So as I said, I will uh, try to, um, you know, cover these things in my presentation. I will go why materials are important in our civilization. And then I quickly jump to the TEM because after all this presentation is about, uh, is about the TEM. Uh, so let me just pick pointer, okay. And then uh, cover a few principles that are, uh, you know, uh, giving us new uh, various te uh, techniques in TEM and then show you some examples from various fields, uh, applying the, its analysis in the form of imaging or ad elemental or chemical mapping, and even investigating properties of materials. And then uh, give you some uh, 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 analysis of uh, future materials or nanomaterials, and then conclude my presentation. So thank you already, you introduced me uh, very nicely. So. I'm a, I'm a MSc from uh, physics uh, from Kadir University. Long time ago, I I feel a uh, little uh, you know uh, hesitant putting that here, so that makes me very old. Uh, but after that, I moved to US for my MS and PhD and did my postdoc as well. Then I worked in different labs in US uh, uh, of TEM labs, uh, and then even joining industry uh, for six years before moving to Saudi Arabia. Uh, 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 in Kinkaust, actually, there I was part of their uh, characterization core lab. And there I stayed there for 10 years. And then now from last two years, I've been here uh, in, uh, in UAE, uh, Khalifa University's physics department. There I am as an assistant professor working. See, uh, and then uh, I will go ahead now, uh, show you a little more about me. Uh, this is my overall uh, field of research, basically, after all. I'm a physicist. I always look uh, for physics in TEM, uh, but uh, as a TEM uh, user or uh, you can say uh, worker, <laughs> so you do have a uh, lot of people coming to you and, uh, and, and, and collaborating with you. So over the last 20 years, I have pretty much collaborated with uh, everybody, uh, particularly people from the field of catalysis, semiconductors, overall nanoscience, nanotechnology, energy material people, solar cells, and metals. And I, because of that, my collaborations, I, I'm lucky to have so many publications on my name. Few of them are mine, about 10 to 15% are mine. Uh, 
where I am either first author or the corresponding author, but majority of them are as co-authors. So I, I apply TEM analysis uh, to various materials, as well as I develop new techniques as well. Particularly, I, I, I was lucky to develop few techniques for the, uh, for the uh, topic on metals. And I will show you one example on that today as well. So here is the uh, introduction about Khalifa University. It's, an, uh, it's a relatively new university compared to LAMS uh, or, or any university in Pakistan. Uh, but it's, uh, it's going up in the ranking very good. Uh, today it's 183rd in the world and 28th in the Asia. It has a very good female pop, uh, enrollment as well. Uh, and then student to faculty ratio, I do not know how good it is, but I just uh, report a number, it's eight to one. I hope it's, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, this is a very, you know, unnecessary slide, but I'm just showing to you where UAE is. It's very close to us, I mean, uh, from Pakistan, two hours uh, flight, very nicely commutable, uh, very enjoyable flight, generally, not like coming from America at 16 hours and you feel like, uh, you know, uh, totally uh, uh, a fatigued person. So and it's a major landmark uh, of Abu Dhabi is this Grand Mosque. Uh, it's actually built based on uh, some ideas from Faisal Mosque of Pakistan as well. Very big mosque, very nice to uh, visit. It looks very nice at night. Okay, now let's get to the presentation. Um, so since this presentation is about TEM and TEM is, is applied to look at the materials, so it's important that uh, we, we look at the materials first. So I start with the evolution of human civilization. Uh, just look at that from different angles. And the first angle I'm presenting is the biologist's angle. So if we go to biology and ask those guys, hey, how the human civilization can be, uh, can be described, they will, okay, tell us, all right, many, many uh, um, uh, million years ago, there were dinosaurs. They got all disappeared by the, you know, uh, meteor fell on, uh, on earth and then killed them or whatever. And then mammals came and here we are mammals and we grew up as human beings. So that's, uh, and after that, it's, it's, it's all history. We just uh, uh, keep looking at how, how we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, socializing or how we are uh, developing uh, our values and cultures. So that's basically the, the angle from biologists and historian will look at uh, slightly different, but close enough. He will say, okay, prehistorically, uh, this is how we were looking like and today and all that he will say, uh, okay, we have modern age, medieval age, all that. So this is the historian's angle, but there is another angle, scientist's angle or material scientist's angle. And that's what more relevant to us as scientists from physics, chemistry or material science. So they will say, all right, uh, if we look at uh, history in terms of materials, we see that uh, humans started with stones as a tool. So they had a material named stone and they, and they devised new uh, tools from it. And then this is how they survived. Uh, uh, and they basically uh, uh, developed some uh, uh, cultures or civilizations. And then it lasts for long, long, long time. And then Bronze Age, Iron Age, and then uh, recently we got Silicon Age, particularly starting from 1947. Yeah, coincidentally, same year when, uh, when Pakistan was created. Uh, and then uh, now we are realizing in 2021 that, uh, that the, uh, the full potential of Silicon Age is probably has been already utilized. And today uh, we need to find new ways. Uh, this question was actually not, I'm sorry, not realized in 2021. It has been realized earlier, but we had been uh, utilizing uh, the silicon age or silicon materials to the full extent uh, and even developing them a little further. But we know that it is not by any means the end of, uh, end of uh, materials development when it comes to uh, new, uh, new uh, uh, devices we need to, uh, to, uh, to fulfill our requirements. So, uh, so this what's next is important and people had been thinking from last uh, couple of decades what will be the next? So, and that's what I'm gonna be focusing on. Uh, so, and what's next is basically is we today put that as together in one word called nanotechnology, okay? 
where things happen at nanoscale. And nanoscale is basically one billionth of a meter scale. So you have a one meter uh, as a standard unit. Uh, and then if you make that billion pieces and, uh, and you start looking at that each piece level, that is called nanoscale. So, and this is what we are talking about. This is unparalleled in our history. It has never been looked at that level before. I mean, we had never been looking at materials at that level before in that, uh, in that uh, uh, meticulous way and to find new, uh, new, uh, new uh, ideas or find new science there that we can use to do various things such as here is the promise of this uh, nanotechnology. Uh, we wanted to make quantum com computers because as I said, the potential of Silicon Age, which has given us the most powerful classical computer, but it has been utilized. There is little we can do now, uh, after, particularly after 10 more years or something. So we do need to find a new uh, types of uh, computing machines and we label them today as quantum computers. Cure for diseases in the shortest time past possible. We are living through this pandemic of COVID-19. We realize that how, how urgent it is for us to get a cure of a, of a pandemic or a big disease right away. So everybody knows that we wanted to have the uh, cure for COVID-19 yesterday. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, a big issue. And nanotechnology promises that to give us a, a cure for diseases in the shortest time possible. And then there are a few other, uh, you know, uh, big, big challenges to human civilization, such as green energy, because we are facing, you know, a global warming, climate change, all those sort of things. Uh, and we need to find uh, greener ways to, uh, to harvest energy. And similarly, not only harvest energy, but also sustainable uh, energy resources. So we can keep using and without changing the, the you know, environment around us too much. And there are many more list, list, list goes on. I just put a few uh, to make my point. Um, just a little more on nanotechnology here. So uh, unlike the traditional approach that was used in Silicon uh, Age, that was called top down, where you pick up a silicon piece or wafer we used to call it, and you pick that and then you carve on the devices on it and then utilize that as for computing uh, purposes. So, so that was called top down. But in nanotechnology, predominantly we use bottom up approach, it means that we start with at atoms or molecules. That's our starting point. We cannot see, unlike in the case of silicon, Silicon wafer is as big as you know uh, 12 inches these days. So it's big uh, and we can see, and then we start making little devices on it. Uh, in, in, the, in the nanotechnology, we go other way around. We pick up the atoms or molecules and, uh, and we mix them uh, uh, and, and make devices. So like such as here. So you can see that uh, when we don't see the atoms or molecules, so characterization uh, becomes very important of those synthesized materials or even before synthesis, the precursors also has to be looked at very, uh, very nicely or uh, at a small scale. So we understand the precursor we are using, uh, is that okay or not okay? So if I give you now, uh, now basically I now take another turn and now I'm gonna just talking about the characterization of materials. So uh, from the characterization of materials, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very helpful if we keep in mind this tetrahedron. This tetrahedron is basically, you start with the materials processing here, uh, and then you come up with the material, and this material has a certain structure. And after that, this structure leads to certain properties of that material. And then you combine these three, you can get the performance of all that. Like if you are going to make a solar cell, you want to make an energy harvester for any other for, uh, way, so things like that. But in the center of this tetrahedron, there is a, you know, a golden box, a, a golden circle, sorry. This circle is the most important by any means. It's, it's the characterization. So every step you are at, you must need to uh, pay attention to the characterization as well, because it has equal distances from all that. It combines, it, it connects all of them. While the others, if you see, uh, they combine few. So, so they miss some. So in this way, you can see that the characterization is essential. It has a central role in, in the materials tetrahedron. Um, 
And then uh, uh, there are many different ways of characterization, but fundamentally for a physicist, only two. You can look at the material, we call it imaging. Okay. Uh, here I'll just make a cartoon of you looking at the mouse head uh, using, the, uh, using the light and light passes through the lens uh, and then falling on the detector CCD in this case. So we have one way of looking at materials imaging. The other way is spectroscopy. In spectroscopy way, basically we, we let the signal, uh, particularly electromagnetic signal, shine on the sample and then it scatters from the sample or material and then we collect. When it collects, it, it brings the signatures to us about the materials and look and analyzing that peaks or, or those uh, signatures, we can come up with a uh, lot of information about the sample. So that's called spectroscopy way. So now that's is all about basically. We're done in terms of characterization. There are many, many techniques. They work at different levels, different sensitivities, all that. So, and I will now uh, take you to only, uh, only the one, uh, uh, you know, about imaging and then little bit combined spectroscopy side by side. So in the case of imaging, we know we have magnifying glasses, we have optical microscope, uh, we have SCMs. Uh, so optical uh, uh, microscope has a bunch of uh, uh, glass lenses, but uh, in the SCM, we do not use uh, light to make the images, we use electrons, matter waves. Uh, why do we use them? Because they have a smaller wavelength and, and in terms of probe, like a beam diameter, they can be made a lot smaller than the light diameter or light beam diameters. So they gave us information from a smaller, uh, smaller area of the sample. And then the last one is the transmission electron microscope. And this is what today I will be talking about. The transmission mic electron microscope is truly an analog of the optical microscope. So these two are exactly the same in terms of uh, physics. Only difference between the two is the, in this case, we're gonna be using light. In this case, we're using electrons. Uh, SEM is slightly different. I don't wanna go into too much of, about that. Uh, so, and when you are doing this modern analysis these days, uh, you buy SEM, you buy TEM, uh, both uh, imaging and spectroscopy are combined, by the way. So let's talk about a little bit more on the imaging uh, and, uh, and particularly about the microscopes, um, the way optical microscope is built. As I said, uh, 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 we will talk a little uh, less on the, on, the, on the SEM, mostly on the you know, TEM. So if I say, okay, what's the limitation of human eye, how small objects human eye can see, it's roughly 75 microns. So below that, we will find it difficult. If you use that as a limit, then uh, there are lots of objects in nature. Uh, they are uh, smaller uh, than, uh, than that size and we like to see that. So we need to use some kind of magnifying device. I already gave examples, magnifying glass, optical microscope, SCM, TEM, and there are many more by the way, and I missed. Uh, and I'm sorry if I missed such as AFM and all that kind of techniques. So, but we know that uh, they're all imaging devices. So, um, so if, for example, if, uh, if you wanted to see, you know, uh, objects uh, with an optical microscope, so we know that the typical magnification we can get is roughly in this range. So from this, we can calculate how small objects we can see. We can see, for example, red blood cells easily with, the, with optical microscope. And then if you wanted to see even uh, smaller objects, uh, so we need to uh, use SCM uh, and, uh, and then that can allow us to magnify up to half a million. Uh, but transmission electron microscope is the only technique that allows us to go magnification of, of up to 2 million. Uh, when you have 2 million magnification and you see the objects that goes to the directly size of an atom roughly. So, and here's an example of TEM image taken of graphene uh, you can see the graphene atoms are uh, are uh, you know sitting in graphene lattice in the uh, honeycomb way or so no, sorry hexagonal way. So we we, uh, we we clearly see atoms each by dot in this image is basically one carbon atom in the graphene, and this is unparalleled, uh, uh, very very uh, uh, powerful technique uh, allows us to see the not only atoms, but let's say if there is a uh, missing atom, we can clearly see that that will be a, a black 
uh, point at that atom location and things like that. If there is a bigger atom such as silicon or you have changed it for some reason that will be brighter than the carbon atoms. So this is already telling us a lot of information just from a single image. Uh, and as I already made the point that transmission electron microscopy is a, an in, indispensable tool for nanoscience and nanotechnology. Um, now, this gives you some idea about the uh, history of, uh, of uh, uh, evolution of resolution of microscopes. Um, it, it comes from a long time with the discovery of a light microscope by, okay, it started with the, uh, Robert Hooke. Uh, there was microscope was already built, but Robert Hooke is the first scientist who really used it uh, and uh, and uh, looked at in a very practical way, and it's uh, it became a scientific tool after that basically. So uh, we see I, I'm showing you two axes. Uh, in one side, I'm showing you re a resolving power, much more like the way we know when we were students, we were looking at the Raleigh criterion. So basically, you have two uh, objects. Uh, what is the minimum distance that you should have to identify them uh, discreetly? So that, uh, that is basically called resolving power. So I'm showing it in angstrom universe level. And then on this side is the uh, feature size. What is the smallest feature that I was presenting before in the form of optical microscope formula? So what's the smallest size you can see by using a microscope? So we see that we were using, using light for a long time. We have lots of uh, scientists coming and making fundamental developments. Uh, that was uh, basically, you know, changing the paradigm uh, of the of the field. Uh, but then, uh, uh, mid 1900s, we realized that we have reached the limit of light microscope. We we uh, uh, perfectized uh, perfect the lenses. Uh, we also uh, optimized the design. Everything. And we reached the fundamental limit called diffraction limit of the microscope. We could not make it better than any, than what it what the light wavelength was basically. The diffraction limit is uh, is coming from the wavelength of the radiation we are using in the microscope. So we reached that limit uh, by mid 1900s. And then, uh, uh, interestingly enough, at the same time, people uh, you know, already uh, we're talking about quantum mechanics and all that. There was, uh, you know, a developed uh, field already. And we knew that by that time, electrons are waves as well. Um, and then uh, people thought, okay, if we want to beat the, you know, diffraction limit, why not use electrons? Because they have even smaller wavelengths and all that kind of things. So when, uh, in Germany, uh, Ernst Ruska, and Andy Nall, they were uh, able to make uh, the first uh, transmission electron microscope that was operating at 75 kilovolts uh, uh, accelerating voltage. And then we see that the resolution is already better than the optical, the best optical microscope. And then it evolved for a long, long time, 50, next 50, 60 years. And then it also reached its limit about you know 20 years ago or something. And then we, we, but we knew the problem with this one. Uh, we knew that the, the lenses in this case, the TEM case, were a lot less perfect compared to the optical lenses. So optical lenses were having no aberrations. Uh, so the microscope resolution in the optical case was uh, limited by the diffraction. But in the case of TEM, the resolution was limited by the aberrations, particularly the spherical aberration. There was a problem. So people then uh, thought about, you know, removing that from the lenses so they can, uh, they can get a better resolution. And indeed that happened uh, also in Germany about two, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, 2000 year. So uh, we have the first aberration collected microscope. And since then this field uh, kicked uh, off like a crazy. So today we have as, uh, high resolution microscope as half angstrom or less. Uh, and these are very advanced microscopes allows us to see, uh, as you saw image of graphene, uh, uh, you know, sheet uh, with no problem whatsoever. So now uh, I think after enough introduction about various things, now let's talk about the real, uh, the instrument this, this talk is about. So here is a schematic of a transmission electron microscope column. So uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, and then we are looking at the cross-section here. 
So it has lots of uh, modules in it, uh, starting with electron gun. It's called gun, not the, uh, uh, you know, uh, anything like electron, uh, I would say electron flood or something, uh, it, because it shoots one electron at a time, okay? So because that's what the gun is does, it shoots one bullet at a time. So, uh, so basically uh, you have that electron gun here, so it gives you electrons. Okay, it gives you electron every nanosecond or, or earlier, that's fine, but each electron comes only one time. No two electrons can come from the gun at the same time. That will be violation of the uncertainty principle. So, uh, uh, so that's uh, basically, uh, uh, the electrons are coming. Uh, we have uh, electromagnetic lenses. So in the case of optical microscope, we have glass lenses to bend the light. But in the case of electrons, we, we, uh, I will go into detail in the next slide, but we apply magnetic field to bend them. And so they, they basically are bent in such a way that, uh, that their action becomes like a lens, particularly like a convex lens. So, uh, so we, we use the uh, use the electromagnetic lenses to collimate uh, the, the electrons. And then we put a sample here and above and below the sample, we have something called uh, the heart of the microscope called objective lens. Uh, you, yes, we have two lenses, but we call it one. It's interesting. Uh, so this objective lens uh, basically forms the first image after the electrons scatter from the sample and then gives us the magnified image about 3000 magnification, but very high resolution because the wavelength is typically less than a picometer in this case. So you can imagine the, the, the wavelength of light, for example, is in microns. Uh, and then this, this um, uh, wavelength is less than a picometer. So because of that, the resolution is very high. We see atoms all those things very easily. The only thing is how to see them. So we put lots of projector or projecting lenses. They are also electromagnetic lensing, uh, lenses. So, so when the electrons pass through them, we end up having a very, very magnified image. Uh, the one you saw like a graphene sheet. So that, that's how we see. All right, and there are many other things that come uh, with this uh, tool. As I told you guys before, the modern uh, imaging devices just don't come as with imaging only capability. They come with the EDX, like an uh, energy dispersive spectroscopy and energy loss um, electron nebulous spectroscopy, and I will I will go into details about that as well. So uh, uh, here is a little bit uh, you know zoomed in uh, information about the transmission of uh, electrons through the sample. First of all, in the case of TEM, some sample has to be thin, actually as thin as possible. So thinner is better because we want elastic electrons. The electrons that pass through the sample, okay. Some of them don't uh, don't get uh, uh, you know diffract uh, sorry scattered at all. So it's like you know you go through a jungle and you never hit any tree on your way. You just came out nicely clean the way you entered. So those are these electrons, and some basically take take turn, but they don't hit the tree. And those are called elastically less scattered electrons. And some will hit either your clothes uh, get uh, some thorns or uh, or you also you know, break some leaves of the trees, uh, branches. So that's called inelastically scattered electrons. And there are many other things. So when, when you are breaking the trees uh, uh, of the tree, uh, leaves of the trees, and then there's a noise coming. And that's, you can think of that uh, X-rays coming from the sample as energy dispersive uh, spectroscopy signal. So, uh, and, uh, and this signal, the one, uh, the, you know, uh, let's say we hit the tree and, and we lost our speed. Or, or, or we can gain even speed in some cases, if there's an uh, animal living in that jungle, so they will make us run faster through the jungle. So these kind of interactions are overall called elastic uh, scattered electrons. So, and that's used in an electron energy loss spectroscopy signal. And many other things, you have a backscattered signal and you have OJ electrons, you have uh, electron hole pairs. I will not go into much, including even visible light, by the way, you get that as well. This technique is gaining a lot more popularity these days. So uh, just uh, uh, how do we understand the scattering? Uh, what are the really physics behind the uh, scattering of electrons uh, from the samples? Here I give you example from a single atom. 
So uh, if the elect a beam electron is passing through the very close to nucleus, it gets scattered so much that it comes back up. So these are called back scattered electrons. If it's little closer, uh, like uh, going through the inner shell uh, uh, electron uh, uh, shells of the atom, then it gets uh, uh, scattered uh, quite a bit. And this angle is quite high in the form of uh, up to 20 or milliradians or something. Uh, the, those electrons are, are the basis of the uh, TEM signal or scanning transmission electron microscopy signal as well. And then the other case is when the beam electron hits the electron of the atoms. So that's the difference. So those two signals are scattering from the nucleus, while this signal is scattering from the electrons of the atoms. So that's the difference between the two. So, so you, if somebody asks you, where is the yield signal coming from? It's coming from the electrons of the atoms. So this way it can make the, these electrons of the atoms jump higher level and they come back. So that's basically the basis of the yield signal or EDX. But this uh, nucleus uh, scattering is only uh, giving us the images. Uh, I already said that overall, uh, if you wanted to understand the total physics behind it, we, we, we need to know the quantum mechanics, we need to know the crystallography and atomic physics, of course. Uh, how the now electron guns looks like. Uh, here is an image from SEM of the tip of uh, electron gun. You can see that, I'm sorry, I'm missing the signal. Uh, I mean, I'm missing the uh, scale. This is roughly, uh, I would say uh, five micron, this one, this scale. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the tip is less than a micron or, uh, in this case. Um, so what we do, we can either heat up this gun. Okay, if we heat up, we heat up so much, like you know, almost 2,000 degree Kelvin. So what happens? The electron in the tip they get so much agitated that the energy is enough to overcome the work function of the metal. Okay, this is typically uh, these days I'm talking about is lanthanum hexaboride a tip. So uh, the uh, work function uh, of that uh, then at 2,000 degree Kelvin is uh, is already I mean. Uh, uh, low for the energy of the electrons when we heat, uh, when we heat the tip that high. So electrons come out uh, and those electrons, uh, if we have put some voltage here below the tip, then they will be attracted and then they move on to the Z direction. And we basically call that emission, thermionic emission. If we apply some electric field while we are heating, then you can see that this is the equation. Uh, this is the, this is, uh, in the case of thermionic emission, uh, we don't have E term. E electric field magnitude is zero. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's true for this uh, line. But if we give some electric field value and then we get this much, you see the work function lowers down by some uh, amount, delta phi w. So you can see that you can get more electrons and, uh, and also you can get uh, electrons at a lower temperature. And if you keep uh, increasing the electric field, you can keep uh, changing the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the profile of the, of the overall work function. And you bring it to the so small scale that electrons don't need to jump over it, but they can tunnel through it. And that is called field emission. And field emission is basically elect uh, 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 electron tunneling current. And this is very popular these days because then you don't need to heat up the tip at all. And this is called cold field emission guns. Uh, and they're very much popular. They give you uh, the best uh, stable, uh, stable in terms of uh, you know, energy spread uh, guns. So very nice uh, sources. And these days you can buy for the case of TEMs uh, from uh, both vendors, either uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific or Joel, both will sell you cold, fish, uh, cold field emission guns. But throughout the previous decades, we had been getting guns like this. We still used to call it a field emission gun, but it wasn't really a field emission gun. It, it was having both thermionic and field emission um, contributions, uh, but we call it shot field emission. Uh, this is the uh, physics of uh, electromagnetic lens. As I said, we have a bunch of coils uh, in the form of circles and we apply electric current. And in the center, then we have magnetic field lines. And these are the field lines that will bend the electrons at a certain energy. So uh, we basically you know, uh, optimize all that. 
and then uh, when the electron passes through them, we use this Lorentz equation. It's, it's purely B field. It doesn't have any contribution from the electrostatic uh, uh, term. So uh, then you can say that, how do you make sure that electric uh, electrons do not gain energy when they pass through the magnetic field? Well, here is the proof. You take the dot product with their velocity of this force, the answer is zero, right? So that, that's exactly what we want. So this is why electromagnetic lenses are very popular. Uh, electrostatic lenses will not give you F dot B is equal to zero. So they change the energy of the electrons when they pass through the lens. While we know that from the lenses of optical microscope, we only want to want to bend the light. We don't want to make the light, you know, change frequency when it passes the glass lenses. So that's exactly uh, it, the electromagnetic lens is doing to the electrons. And luckily, when you, uh, I mean, luckily means not entirely true, but 99% uh, true. So you can draw the ray diagram just like the glass lens for this case as well. So we are very lucky and we can use lens makers formula one over U plus one over V is equal to one over F. You can use that even for magnification, it works. And that's why TEM and optical microscope are exact copy of each other. Uh, so, but unlike the case of optical microscope, we are very lucky in the TEM case, we can look at both planes. We can look at the focal plane or we can look at the image plane. In the focal plane, we call it selected electron area diffraction. And this gives us the information about the structure of the materials that the electrons are scattering from here. Their sample is sitting here. So, and our lens is collecting them and giving us focal point and the image plane point. So we, we see that Im focal plane has the structure information and the uh, image plane has the uh, feature or morphology information. But if our resolution is too much good, very high magnetic resolution, which is true in the case of TEM, we can see the structure in this case as well, because we have resolution. We, in the case of optical microscope, we don't have resolution to see the atoms, for example. This is the typical uh, four types of images you can see in the diffraction plane. If material is nanocrystalline, you see fuzzy rings. If it's polycrystalline, sharp rings and dots, uh, if the single crystal and then disks, if you have focused the beam, this is a beam effect. Very useful though. In the case of uh, images, uh, here is the uh, one type of contrast that you can expect in the, in the TEM. So if you have uh, thinner areas, and you have a thicker areas of the sample. So you can see that thicker area will scatter more electrons and thinner will scatter less electrons because most electrons will go through without scattering. But then we put an object uh, aperture below the lens and this collects the scattered electrons basically. So overall, if you see that the thicker areas will end up here and thinner areas will end up here, but the signal is more on this side. So it will be higher in brightness and that side will be lower in brightness. So in a way, thicker areas will appear darker and thinner areas will appear lighter in the case of TEM. And you can get thick or thin, not just based on thickness, but also based on density, don't we? So, and that's why the overall, con so basically you have a combined effect of density and thickness in these images. And this is why it's called mass thickness contrast. But another thing happens, as I told you guys before, because the electron wavelength is very small, it's small enough that our electrons can scatter under the Bragg condition from the sample, if sample is, a, is, a, is, a, um, is, is crystalline. And that uh, scattering is called uh, uh, Bragg scattering or diffraction scattering. And we can see that we make dots uh, much more like the way I was telling you these. So basically these are the Bragg scattering in from single crystal or from a polycrystal sample. So, and, and, and we can block certain beams and make images of other types. Uh, uh, but we, before that, and here we can see then in the image, so if we put same aperture, like the way we did here, uh, we can see some, some crystals are dark, some are white, even though they're all the same thickness, same density, it's the same metal. So then why they're darker and bright? Uh, because they're diffracting. So the diffracting signal, you can see that uh, are the ones that are black uh, because they're under black condition and they are going away from the direct beam. So here is the direct beam. So this is our whole size. So only those electrons will go through which are coming directly. 
So this is why these electrons are stopped and they appear dark in our image. So that's called diffraction contrast. But let's say we put a big enough aperture. We don't put a small aperture, we a big one. So we, we, only, uh, we also allow diffracted beam to enter into our image. Then the, uh, the Bragg uh, planes we saw, uh, I mean, noticed in our uh, focal plane, uh, now they will be also appearing in our image. This image is called uh, uh, phase contrast because it's showing the uh, uh, phase of the electrons uh, you know, but the phase is defined by the D spacing. We call them Bragg, uh, Bragg spacing or, or Bragg condition, like a first HKL, second HKL, and so on. This is negative direction. And, and this is an image of a gold particle sitting on carbon, and we see the lattice planes of, uh, of uh, gold. But that's a crystallographer's view. But for a physicist, he will say, oh, we see phase contrast coming from the grating. And that grating happens to be gold lattice. And here's another image of, uh, of a single crystal, uh, a phase contrast image. Uh, it's basically gallium nitride crystal uh, look from top, uh, magnified enough uh, that we see the atoms of gallium nitride and the space between them. And we see that we can take a very nice image of, uh, of uh, gallium uh, lattice by using electron microscope. And taking the Fourier transform of that image, we can come up with information about the uh, uh, crystal structure and uh, many things. You can do the same analysis on this one as well, but we are so much familiar with the diffraction plane coming from the axial diffraction, then this, uh, this analysis becomes easy for us. Uh, now I'm gonna show you some of the things that can be done by using the, uh, by using uh, uh, you know, spectroscopy mode, uh, I mean, in, in the uh, combined with the imaging mode and TEM. So we have a, this is applied to a nanomaterial, uh, material with have a nanoparticle, small size nanoparticle. We take an image and we do EDX on it. Uh, we saw uh, a bunch of uh, peaks coming in the EDX spectrum from different atoms. So you have copper and, and carbon. I show them in green color. Why? Because they are coming from the TEM grid. You, you cannot put your powder in TEM directly you need to put it on a grid and that grid will uh, go into the microscope. And when you do EDX analysis or X-ray collection of the sample from the sample, uh, you always get copper and carbon signals. Uh, so basically we say we ignore them. Uh, and then uh, uh, we see other peaks. We have oxygen peak, we have phosphorus peak, we have cal uh, potassium and then cobalt peaks. So, okay, but this means we have these four elements. All these nanoparticles are of four types of elements. Uh, if you uh, talk to the now guy who synthesized them, no, no, he will say, I, I was only making copper uh, phosphide or copper oxide. Please tell me, do my particles have only uh, two elements or all of them? So then you can uh, look at the morphology. You see that this morphology is quite big compared to these. So then you can shine the beam only on this nanoparticle and then on a big guy. And then you can look at two different EDX spectra and you see that. In the case of where the, you know, you're putting the beam on nanoparticles, you got cobalt and you got, uh, you got a little bit of phosphide is almost, you know, uh, uh, missing. Um, no, you, you have little, but very little. I mean, you have mostly ox oxygen. So you, then we see that we know that this, these particles of cobalt oxide, and then you go to the red one, uh, a, a red one, you see that uh, you see have, we have a potassium and oxygen, uh, so the, uh, a little bit cobalt, that's basically precursor they were using. So that's how, uh, so basically unreactive precursor. So this is how you can easily identify by combining the spectroscopy with imaging, um, what really is happening. So uh, now, uh, interestingly enough, I, I said, uh, without talking too much about the electron energy loss spectroscopy, uh, actually what it is, uh, it is nothing but uh, electron prism, electron energy loss spectroscopy. And what, what's the challenge here? The challenge is, I was telling you on the slide where the electron beam was passing through the sample and giving us a variety of signals. So we wanted to now collect the inelastic signal. So we wanted to differentiate the electrons. They were just passing through without losing energy or they were scattering, but still not losing energy. And then the electrons that were losing the energy, we wanted to separate them. So we wanted to separate them based on their energy. 
And what does that do in the case of light? Light prism, right? When the white light falls on the prism, we see a rainbow on the other side. So that's exactly what we need. Uh, and that can be done by electron prism. And this is how the shape of the electron prism is. It's like a horseshoe shape. So electrons pass through it and they get separated based on their energies. And here is the cartoon of that signal. So you have lots of electrons, same energy. These are the electrons, they were scattered at, without uh, you know, losing energy. We call them elastically scattered electrons or direct electrons and then other peaks, energy loss one, energy loss two, and so on. So if the, you can imagine now, if the electrons are lost energy from carbon, they will lose, uh, let's say S orbit, 284 EV, or they lost energy from oxygen, again, S orbit, that will be 532 EV. So uh, you can see that the uh, carbon will appear here and the red place will appear oxygen. So, and if we somehow can separate them and then we can make the image coming from only carbon or coming from only oxygen. And that's what is exactly done. It's a, it's a very expensive technology, but possible. Uh, and that's how it was done when applied to a material, a nanomaterial, which was basically carbon, titanium, iron, uh, oxide, nanoparticles. So you have four elements uh, and we are uh, here plotting only three because oxygen is, uh, is everywhere where you have titanium uh, because it was a you know iron doped titanium peaks uh, nanoparticle sorry uh, but after that they were coated with carbon so you can see that uh, uh, iron is uh, presented in green color and uh, and you have titanium in red so iron and red are together so I, I, so basically iron got doped and then um, carbon got coated because it's a blue signal. It's only going around the particles. So by using this electron energy loss spectroscopy combined with imaging, so not only we do spectroscopy here, we can combine with imaging and make the FTEM uh, maps. Here is another example, and these are also uh, titania, uh, but carbon coated, but this is a healing material. Uh, we can differentiate where is the uh, polymer and where is the titania uh, uh, nanowires. Uh, now I'm gonna switch the gears. I'll go to the scanning transmission electron microscope. So before we were making the image just like an optical microscope, now we are making the image like an SEM, but in the transmission mode, not in the scanning, uh, or you can say uh, secondary electron mode. No, we're looking at the transmission. So our beam is scanned like SEM, but we're not collecting the signal uh, above the sample. We are still below the sample and sample still has to be very, very thin. Obviously we scan in pixels, like a, what's the area we pick. And then we at each pixel, we dwell some time and then uh, collect the signal, uh, transmitted signal. But we can also get either EDX signal or yield signal. Uh, uh, now you realize that we cannot use our prism in the form of image, uh, we can only use in the form of spectroscopy because for imaging, we need to have image coming first. We never bring the image to the prism now. We always bring some electrons at a given pixel. Our pixel is not a image of the full, full uh, features. It's just a part of the feature. So the image will not help us now here. So using the prism in, uh, I mean, the image mode will not help. It has to be in spectroscopy alone but we can synchronize them and we can combine the image of, this is the image making, I mean, pixel by pixel image, like SEM style, uh, making a detector. Uh, and then we combine that detector with, or synchronize this detector with EDX and EELS, and we can do a, a bunch of things. And here I apply this to a, to a iron uh, 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 copper alloy, basically iron, little bit of copper, and uh, by using yields, we can easily identify the copper precipitates in iron. And you can, this, you can use the scanning transmission mo uh, mode uh, for EDX to combine, to make the line profiles. Here we have an energy material, uh, zinc oxide and a hafnium oxide, let, uh, you know, uh, repeating uh, layers uh, by making a line profile, just walk from here to here and, and collect the signal of hafnium and zinc and you can see easily identify where is zinc and where is hafnium. So our, which one is hafnium layer and which one is the zinc oxide layer. And we see that uh, zinc oxide layer is the small one, uh, about uh, two nanometer. 
and we can stem is very powerful technique because in many ways it's uh, more sensitive to atomic number of the uh, of the atoms in the sample so we can we can easily identify the clusters of different metals loaded onto catalyst spores for example so here if we have a nanomaterial we have uh, iridium and tin nanoparticles coated on silicon oxide and we we can clearly identify the size and uh, and shape of those iridium tin nanoparticles. You can see that they, they come in different size, about two nanometers. So some are as small as clusters or are close to a uh, few atoms clusters. And then uh, this is a zinc, uh, silicon oxide. And here in this case, we have a uh, platinum atoms on titanium oxide. Uh, and each white dot is basically a single atom. And we can see that some are getting making clusters that they are nearby and some are alone atoms. They're anchored onto the defects of titanium oxide uh, surface. And again, STEM can be applied to even uh, uh, identify the atoms in the lattice. Here we have a strontium titanium, uh, titanate lattice. Uh, we know where is, uh, you know, actually, sorry, we don't know where is the titanium, where is the strontium, oxygen, and that can be identified by going to the each atom type and collecting the EDX signal and plotting that signal, we can color these atoms. And here we have red in titanium and green in strontium. So, okay, so far I, I gave you the imaging and element information. Let's talk about now what I can do about the bulk properties. So for that, this is my uh, research. I'm very proud of this research. We developed new things in it, but I will start with the aluminum alloy characterization first and then finish it uh, with the properties. So here we have aluminum alloy, very much uh, popular in uh, in aerospace industry. You mainly have uh, have uh, you know aluminum. You add very small amount of other uh, metals in it, uh, you know, and then uh, you process that alloy and they make precipitates. And they come in many many shapes, and you see them. They are so much, by the way. You see that. So uh, you can use a stem mode either in a bright field or dark field. To see these precipitate sizes and shapes very nicely, but if we apply uh, this in the with the spectroscopy, uh, you see uh, this, this is a little magnified image. We already have uh, a very nice information. So, for example, here you see that. So, if you look at the aluminum peaks, uh, you know it's everywhere. Uh, you look at copper peaks, you see these uh, white uh, needle-like precipitates, but of copper and zirconium make some uh, small size these. And the silver is uh, shown in cyan color. So, so we can see what they're doing uh, <clears throat> in the aluminum lattice. But uh, STEM, again, is, uh, can be also used to imaging uh, of metals. Metals are very stable under the electron beam. So we can take a very high resolution image, particularly if the microscope is aberration corrected. And this image is taken from that in the bright field mode of one of the copper you know, precipitate in aluminum. So we see that aluminum lattice, and then there are other uh, precipitates are coming in the way as well. But I'm interested in this one, which is called T1 precipitates. And there are lots of models available in the literature that we can uh, you know, borrow and see how, what type of precipitates are made in our alloy and uh, get a higher magnification and then plotting the line profile and, and then combining with the uh, signal of the atoms, uh, composition signal, I mean, we can come up with the model, which model is good for this case. In this case, it was this one, uh, number three. And then uh, now, we, uh, okay, that was the characterization, but uh, the, the properties, we can use the yields uh, mode to come up with the uh, properties such as uh, a bulk modulus or, uh, or you can say Young's modulus because Young's modulus is, uh, is, is a bulk property and it brings information about the bonding and in the yields, zero loss yields, the plasma and peak is basically nothing but valence peak. So by, by uh, looking at the change in the plasma and peaks, we can come up with the uh, map for the bulk modulus of the metals. Uh, and that's, it was done. There is a formula for it. Uh, and then we apply this. This is what we had been doing uh, from last two, three years uh, in our group and trying to develop uh, this uh, uh, technique further. So, and we have been able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make a Young's modulus map of this aluminum alloy that I was showing you. So we can see that some precipitates, uh, Young's modulus goes higher than the, um, 
then the lattice, uh, aluminum lattice, in other case, gets less. So this, this, uh, this brings me to my conclusions. So, uh, so here I conclude. So nanotechnology, basically, uh, it's like our stone in 21st century. You know, stone was of anything. It can be a calcium stone, can be some other stone, but we wanted to use a stone uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, now we are at the same level where we are uh, making materials of all types. We don't know which one is the good one but we are keep trying and that's what nanotechnology promises us. And that's why it should be taken as, as well in my view. So it's, a, it's our 21st century stone and the characterization of these stones, we call it nanomaterials today, is very essential. And uh, it's basically uh, uh, is the key to understand their uh, uh, difference between classical properties to quantum properties. And for all that, uh, TEM promises uh, a big potential, gives big potential actually uh, to, uh, to look at the properties, look at the composition, to look at the structure, you name it, size and shape as well. So it, it, uh, it really promises uh, uh, in a big way, uh, it's our, uh, you know, one of the most powerful tools to look at the nanomaterials. Uh, so uh, it not only allows us to understand the overall material, but also, allows us to understand the physics and chemistry, like a bonding type of things. Uh, with that, I stop, but uh, all this presentation is not purely from my work. I have collaborated with a lot of people. So I thank my colleagues and major collaborators. The list is big, but I just pick few people. And with that, I stop and I'm uh, now uh, you know, ready to answer some questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anjum, for, for a wonderful presentation. Very, very uh, interesting and, and enlightening. Uh, and, 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 and now we would uh, request the, the, the participants, if they have any questions, please type in, or uh, you can raise your, okay. your digital hand and then we'll allow you to speak. Uh, we already have one question here. If, if you can read it, Anjum, so otherwise I'll no, read actually, it for you. Actually, this, this is what I was gonna look at. Uh, so I look at why the most, So the question is why we mostly prefer to take EDX spectrum, why not wavelength dispersive spectrum? Uh, so, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, very nice question. Uh, in fact, that one is done in the case of SEM very routinely. It brings a lot of extra information. First of all, increases your resolution in the EDX, plus it uh, also allows you to look at some of the properties, like a valence properties. You can differentiate uh, insulators from metals and many other things. I'm, uh, I'm not 100% sure exactly, but this field is very, very popular in EDX, uh, sorry, in SEM field. Uh, well, in the case of TEM, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, signal is less. Uh, so putting so much effort for WDS uh, is just uh, too much uh, work. So people don't do it in the case of TEM. Thank you. Any any other questions, please? If you have a question, please either type in or, or raise your hand. Either they understand everything or <laughs> uh, PhD students questions Yeah, I, 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 yes, they should. They should. Uh -huh. Should we should we should we from the from the from 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 next time should we ask uh, we, we should should we start calling out names so that <laughs> okay, there is a question. What should be the type of material? Uh Liquid solid. Very nice question. Uh, material liquid solid. Uh, actually, very very nice question. I am sorry. I just uh, avoided uh, you know the liquids altogether. Even though uh, I spent half of my career on looking at liquids uh, with the TEM. This this field is called cryo TEM. I'm sure you guys have heard about it in the case of cryo SEM. Very very useful. Today, cryo-SEM is one of the uh, you know, uh, most important techniques in the dairy industry and many, many other industries because people want to, you know, even ice cream industry, for example, they want to develop the new recipes based on you know, SEM analysis, like a nanoscale. And same goes for the TEM. 
I will take you guys, you know, if you remember my nanotechnology, I said that we want to have, uh, we want to have, you know, cure for diseases in the shortest time possible. Uh, basically, the biological stuff is most of time in the liquid form. Why we keep it in liquid form? Because if we take the liquid out, so they, they, they dry out and then they change their types, I mean, size and shape. So do you want to image the biological materials in liquid form? And how do you do that? We basically take a very small of liquid and then freeze it and look at it. This overall field is called cryo-TEM. It's one of the most important techniques. If you want to buy latest cryo-TEM today from the market, you will be ha uh, better having about $10 million in your pocket. And uh, because this microscopes is now fundamental for pharmaceutical industry, Actually, we have COVID vaccine today just because of cryo-TEM, and I'm not kidding. Uh, so most of the Thermo Fisher, uh, uh, companies like Thermo Fisher or Joel, they were busy with the pharmaceutical people, giving them the size and shapes or evolution of COVID-19 and what kind of protein uh, images uh, are those look like and how drug is attaching to this. And that was done by the cryo-TEM. So liquids are as important as, as solids. When it comes to TEM. Does this answer your question? I'm sorry. It's from the last server. Yes, I, I I I don't know if it's um it's if it is a linear okay. process yeah. to, to unmute and, 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 and say yes or no because we okay. are in a I see the question AFM and uh, and uh, TEM. Uh it's a nice question. Uh Okay, uh, uh, and Glam server says that what's the size? Okay, be, before I answer Asif's question, I wanna answer uh, Glam's uh, question first. Uh, the size is uh, in the case of uh, beam penetrating direction, it has to be uh, less than 500 nanometers. While in the case of X and Y direction, it's literally like my paper, you know, paper of a book. So, uh, so it has to be like that, thin and when the beam goes through, and X and Y can go up to many, many microns, many, many microns. Uh, there is no limit almost, it can be even thousand microns or so. Uh, so that's the size. And talking about Asif's question about AFM and TEM, TEM, I already explained, it's just like a, just like the case of optical microscope, you can literally uh, copy the two, uh, ac accept, replace the uh, photon with electrons. Okay, when it comes to uh, AFM, it's uh, atomic force. Now we are uh, making image much more like SCM in the case of AFM, I mean. So you bring a very thin tip, uh, about 10 nanometer in diameter close to the atom surf uh, material surface. And, and there are atomic forces uh, between the two uh, tip and the, and the you know, surface of the sample. And you measure them using a feedback loop. And then you plot them pixel by pixel. And that is AFM. I can't, uh, obviously, AFM is a very much a developed field as well. It has its advantages. It can look at things in live way, like you can look at live cells, and you can do much more other things, such as uh, you know you can scan questants, magnetic field. Many things can be done with AFM. It comes with a variety of tips, uh, and so it's a very powerful technique. It's very uh, good. Uh, but obviously, if you have a characterization lab, you cannot uh, replace one over the, with the other one. You need to have both. All right. And then the, the other question is from IFRA. Uh, we can rank STD, SCM, uh, and uh, over uh, TEM while STD, uh, SCM. Uh, you, you, STD means standard, I would say. Uh, is that true, uh, IFRA? Uh, and then uh, we are performing both scanning and transmission while TEM, uh, we only do transmission. I think uh, he's talking about STEM, uh, not yes, STD. Yes, he said that in, in the latter part. Yes, so yes, actually that is true. In the case of uh, scanning SEM, as I said, uh, maybe I can draw this, I need to share my screen. Okay, let me see. So in the case of SEM, I'm sure you guys have seen this before, but uh, let's say you have a sample with some roughness. You bring a beam, uh, typical energy. Oh, sorry. I focused the beam, a beam earlier. Uh,
Okay. So typical energy is 30 keV. So beam passes through the surface and then interacts. Is the, we call it interaction volume. And then this interaction volume from the top surface, less than I would say 50 nanometer or something. I, I maybe five nanometer actually, five nanometer or so. Uh, we get the secondary electrons. Secondary electrons are the electrons that atoms give us. These are called primary electrons. And these electrons are secondary electrons. And their energy is, uh, again, very small, less than 50 EV. Actually, that's Dr. how Dr. Dr. Anjama, we, we, we don't see. I think we don't see the screen that you are drawing on. We are seeing your acknowledgment page from your oh, presentation. OK, let me stop and try one more time. I said screen here. Maybe I did not. OK, now you guys see it? Yes, yes, yes. OK. So this is the secondary electron. So at each pixel of uh, scanning, like raster scan, we can, uh, and we stop, let's say one millisecond. So we get intensity of this signal. So we get S, it's an electron signal. And let's say my raster scan was like that shape. So we literally just make a matrix. Uh, we say, okay, here I got 100 electrons, there I got 50, and here I got 1,000, and so on. And uh, just like AFM way, AFM, we look at this atomic force uh, signal. You can call it atomic force signal. And then we plot that. So literally there is no difference between SCM and AFM in terms of principle or physics. Um, uh, we, in one case, we plot a secondary electron signal. In other case, we plot atomic force signal. So, but we have the same kind of image. So that's SCM. In the case of a scanning transmission uh, signal, uh, we need to have first thin sample. So thickness has to be like a paper, uh, less than 500 nanometer. Actually, thinner is better. We ideally want to have 100 nanometer. So again, now we uh, focus our beam on sample surface, our uh, inside sample. Uh, now, there, there is a two, two difference between SCM and the uh, STEM. Uh, one is the pixel size. Our pixel size here can be as small as less than an angstrom. Okay, and dwell time is uh, about a microsecond. Okay, and then we don't look at the scanty electrons. This energy is 300 keV typically. And scanty electrons, if you remember, it's 50 eV. But we look at the same 300 electron signal here. 300 keV electron signal. So this is our signal and we call it hard of signal many times. High angle annular dark field signal. Uh, and we collect in this, uh, I, I mean, you remember my cartoon, I was presenting in the presentation. So this is the signal and each pixel we collect that signal. And now you can see because of the pixel size is so small, this is the pixel size. And we basically, uh, you know, construct an image. And, and uh, if the material has a crystal structure, we will be able to see atoms and no atom places very easily. Or if the, you know, platinum atom is sitting on top of, of uh, titanium oxide crystal, we can easily identify because signal from titanium is roughly uh, Z1 square and Z1 is uh, 23, if I remember, titanium atom number. Uh, and then the signal from uh, platinum is it's Z2 square and Z2 is very high. It's uh, higher than uh, even gold, I believe. So it's, it's like 80 or something. Uh, 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 Z is 80. Uh, I don't know the number, I'm sorry, uh, but you can check. So platinum atomic number is as close to as, you know, 80. You can see that the, uh, the signal coming from platinum is going to be huge compared to, uh, compared to uh, titanium signal. And that's why we can even identify single platinum atoms sitting on uh, titanium oxide crystals. Uh, so that's how they are different than the uh, Okay, if you ask me TEM, uh, TEM is like this. So you have full, again, uh, sample. Uh, now beam is coming as a flood, full beam. Huh? Uh, so uh, beam is coming like that, it scatters, and we have a lens below it. And this lens actually makes the either diffraction pattern or the image pattern. Resolution is also very high. In this case, resolution is governed by the wavelength, which is less than a picometer. In this case, the resolution, yes, it is governed by the wavelength, but more important than that is the beam size here, because that depends on the wavelength. 
and beam size is uh, typically in the uh, range of a of 1.5 angstrom modern TEMs. So this is the beam size at that location. So and this is why we can see atoms uh, in STEM mode. I hope this answers uh, your question, Ifra. So um, once again, uh, if if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, virtually thank uh, the speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anjum, for for your time and for your wonderful presentation. We are very happy to 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 have had the opportunity to hear from you and and, and learn about your research and your um, your your experiments. Uh, with this, I I thank you and and thank you all for 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 the for the very enthusiastic participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Bye -bye. Yeah, shukriya about the the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.